great to be here. So, how many of you know in great detail what phonesis is? Right. How many of you kind of know or don't have a clue? All right, good. So you're not wasting your time here, Jim. Well, this picture. Somebody up a, running up a trail and getting some good exercise, but that's kind of a vague concept of hormesis, and I think we're going to get into a little bit of detail about what hormesis exactly is. And so the subtitle of my talk is The Biology of Beneficial Adaptation to Stress. People think stress is always bad, but stress can be good. I write a blog called Getting Stronger. The byline is Train Yourself to Thrive on Stress. I think that's kind of a catchy byline. Uh, and you'll hopefully understand what that means when you get through this talk. I've given three previous talks at AHS. One of them was on nutritional supplements. I don't think they're always a good idea. Another talk in Berkeley was on how to reverse myopia. And then in Boulder, I talked about the benefits of living at high altitude and the implications for that. But this year, I'm going to talk more fundamentally about hormesis. So we have a lot of epidemics of metabolic disorder, cancer, de uh, depression, obesity. There's some thoughts within this organization about what causes those. A lot of the ideas that you're hearing here come out of the concept that stress is at the root of all of the problems or one of the key drivers. But I think I would like to turn that on its head and propose that maybe we suffer from a lack of beneficial stress. The, the key is understanding what beneficial stress is. So first, hormesis. It's not homeopathy. People get that confused all the time. It's actually a real scientific concept. It's a concept in toxicology, which is, was first controversial and is now becoming better accepted. There is a f researcher, Edwin, Edward Calabrese, and Suresh Rattan, who've done countless studies. There's over 9,000 uh, case reports of hormetic effects, and I'll get into that a little bit. But first, what is hormesis? It's the beneficial response of an organism to a low-dose stressor that would otherwise be detrimental or even lethal at a high dose. Uh, it works by activating some endogenous responses, some defense and repair mechanisms in your body. And the result is that you're better off than where you started. You get a super compensation. You, you end up stronger than before you experienced the stress. Now, here's what a hormesis toxicology plot looks like. You'll see a dashed line running through the center here. That's the baseline of whatever organism is tested. It could be a human, it could be a plant or a microbe. This has been done on all kinds of organisms. You expose it, I'm sorry, expose it to a stress which is uh, down here at the bottom, a dose. And initially, you actually get a stimulation effect, a beneficial response. If you go too high, however, into the red zone, you get a detrimental effect. And most toxicology is looking at much higher doses. But in this low-dose regime, you can actually get a stimulation effect. The issue is, what's that cutoff between benefit and adverse effects? So here's some typical curves from toxicology. You're showing two two plots here. One is the effect of alcohol on the hormones in a, in a rat, looking at testosterone, luteinizing hormone. And you can see that initially, at very low levels of alcohol, there's a stimulating effect. The rat gets more testosterone. But at high levels, it's suppressing. Uh, uh, here's another plot showing the effect of an herbicide, 2,4-D, on oysters, uh, on oyster growth. And actually, this herbicide, right, toxic chemical, at a very low dose, gives a stimulation effect. Why is that? Because there's probably a defense response in the oyster. But at high levels, it's detrimental. So again, over 9,000 toxicology studies looked at, and about one-fifth of them showed hormesis. So this is pretty interesting. Of course, that dose is different for the, the, the cutoff dose is different for every particular agent. So some, sometimes it's in the PPM level, sometimes it's much higher. So there's a huge variation in the hormetic dose. 
Why is there hormesis? Why is there hormesis in every microbe, in every plant, in every organism? And that's for a simple reason. Without it, the species would have died out because the environment is stressful. If you didn't have the ability to adapt to stress, you're gone. Here's an example of some coral from uh, the area of American S Samoa. And recently, they found that the coral growing in the warmer waters are now more resistant to bleaching. That's an adaptation, right? We all ourselves can experience adaptations to environmental stress. So it's ubiquitous in nature. So what's the connection then with ancestral health? All right, a lot of the talks here are focusing on novel foods, novel chemicals, but maybe we look at the other way about what's missing. What's missing from our modern environment that our ancestors had. Here's a quote from Alastair Nunn. I think it's a great quote. And he was sort of surveying the mechanisms of, of hormesis, but relating it back to ancestral health. I'll just read it. Ancient man was a hunter-gatherer, often traveling long distances to find food, avoid threats, and seek shelter. In contrast, many modern Western societies have transformed their surroundings in order to minimize or even eliminate environmental threats and stresses that our ancestors were exposed to, including food and water shortages, predation, infections, extreme of temperature, and the need to carry out regular physical activity. So we're suffering from a lack of hormesis. That's a big difference in our modern society. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit about what hormesis is. Beneficial response to low-dose stressors that give you a compensating benefit. But what are the mechanisms? How does it actually work? So the rest of this talk is not going to be so much practical steps that you can take, but I think if you understand the theory behind it and understand the underlying basis, you can apply it. My blog has got post after post of how this applies in many different cases. But I want to give you the basic principles. And for that, I've looked at all the studies on hormesis, and I think they fit into four different levels, from the very low structural hormesis, your bones and your tissues and your muscles, and even your eyes. We'll get into that. The next level is defense. That's your immune system and also your xenobiotic defense. That's a system of phase one and phase two detox enzymes that protect you against chemical toxins, but also against the phytonutrients in broccoli. The metabolic hormesis is the next level, which is how hormesis can upregulate your whole utilization of energy. And I think that ketogenic dieting is a form of hormesis. And finally, very important, but not to be overlooked, psychological hormesis. And we'll talk about uh, what that means and the neurological basis for it. Okay, so let's start with structural hormesis. Um, so there's four types of hormesis that I'd like to talk about here. Resistance exercise, weight-bearing exercise, playing the guitar, barefoot running, and distance focusing. All right, and each of these has a hormetic effect. So let's get into them. So let's start with resistance exercise and muscle growth. What, this is the most familiar example of hormesis. We're all familiar with it. When you go to the gym, you lift weights, and straining your muscles causes a microtrauma and an inflammatory response. And specifically, it's mediated by growth factors like IGF-1, growth hormone, and myogenic regulatory factors called MRFs. And then what happens is these stimulate the satellite cells, their stem cells in your muscles, to differentiate and grow into microfibrils that grow and fuse with their fibers, and you get a resulting uh, supercompensation that results in a net increase in muscle size. If you have too much of this, right, that's the red part of the hormetic curve, you can get delayed onset muscle soreness, pulled muscles, so you want to be in that hormetic zone. Supercompensation, very important concept to understand here because when you start training, and this applies to any kind of hormesis, not just lifting weights, you get a net decrease in function, right? That's shown on, on the, in the red part of this uh, curve here. And it takes you maybe a couple days to recover, but if you do it right, you actually end up stronger than you started out. And if you can do this in repeated cycles, you're moving up that curve. Another example is strengthening your bones. When you lift weight, weight-bearing exercise, this is very important in people as they get older too. You're actually putting a load onto the bone and the fluid around the osteocytes compresses them and this generates the release of proteins called focal adhesion kinase 
It stimulates new bone growth. And then you get the secretion of uh, collagen that mineralizes and stronger bone, all right? If you do it too much, bone fracture, right? We're always talking about the right level of stress here. Callus formation, very familiar to all of us who write, who do ballet, barefoot running, do rock climbing like I do. And this is what happens when you expose the skin to friction or pressure. You actually cause the production of an enzyme called transglutaminase that cross-links the skin and makes it tougher. So it's an example also of specific hormesis. There's a general concept called the SED principle, specific adapt adaptation to imposed demand. And what that means is the stress gives you the benefit where it's applied. If I lift weights with my upper body, it doesn't benefit my lower body. If I play the guitar with my left hand, you know, I get the don't get the calluses on my right hand. Can we apply this to the eyes? I gave a talk in Berkeley on myopia. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of the evidence for this or the technique. You can watch that video, but I want to just talk about the mechanism here because it turns out that the way you focus actually changes the structure of your eye long term. Uh, short term, you can see that when you're looking up close, the crystalline lens expands and you get a different, uh, uh, and you're able to focus on near objects. And when you're looking at, in the distance, it flattens out. But what happens in myopia is that normally your vision is focused on the back of the retina. But if you do a lot of near work, computers and reading, you're starting to focus in front of the retina, all right? Now what happens then, and I'll explain the biochemistry of this, uh, now you need a corrective lens because you need to uh, shorten the eye. But that distance correction causes further elongation and what we call axial myopia. And then you go through a cycle where you have to get stronger and stronger and stronger lenses. And it's not really correcting the problem, it's actually making it worse. And why is this? The, there's a great series of papers called the Incremental Retinal Defocus Theory, IRDT, uh, by a couple of researchers like Hung and Siafreda. And they've shown that repeated defocus cycles cause the release of neuromodulators like glutamate, acetylcholine, GABA, dopamine, serotonin. And this actually weakens the, the eye because it changes proteoglycan synthesis in the sclera. That's the white of your eye, which is most of your eye. And what happens then is the eye becomes longer and it elongates. And repeated cycles of this lead to permanent myopia. And hyperopia is, of course, the reverse. You're, you're focusing not too close, but too far. And this has been shown experimentally uh, in, in different animals, in chicks, in monkeys, but also in humans. And what you can see here is a study showing the change in axial length in microns based on the time of exposure to a positive or a negative defocus. And you can see in only a short number of minutes to an hour, you're already seeing small changes. And there have been further follow-up studies showing that for longer cycle periods, the change in axial length increases even more so. So how do you, deal, how do you apply hormesis here? You reverse the process. You use print pushing, or the, what we call reader lenses, plus lenses when working up close to stimulate defocus in the opposite direction, or you spend a lot more time uh, when you're outside with progressively weaker lenses. And you can look at my uh, video to see more de detail on this from the Berkeley talk. Okay, the next level of hormesis up from structural is defense hormesis. And this is the strengthening of your immune system and your xenobiotic defenses. Uh, and I'll give, a, I've got a few examples here. Probiotic microbes actually stimulate the training of our immune system, our Tregs, our regulatory T cells. Food allergens uh, at low levels can be used in immunotherapy to improve uh, and lessen the uh, response to allergy. Xenobiotic chemicals, not just phytochemicals, but even toxins, uh, interact with our NRF2 system to upregulate our endogenous phase two enzymes. And in even certain aromatic chemicals like uh, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons some of the compounds found in charred meat uh, can upregulate our cytochrome P450 system to 
stimulate that and make us more prone to be able to defend ourselves against some of these toxins. So I'll just talk about a few of these in the interest of time. One of them has to do with probiotics, and now I'm thinking of them as hormetic agents. All right, there's a great book here which I would really encourage you to read. It's called An Epidemic of Absence, A New Way of Understanding Allergies and Autoimmune Diseases by Moises Valeskov Manoff. And he goes through case after case of specific different allergy, allergenic uh, issues and uh, autoimmune diseases and shows how, while most of us think that the problem has to do with the introduction of novel foods or chemicals, in fact, immunologists are starting to see the importance of the microbiome and the disappearance of the ancient microbiome which helped us regulate our response to foreign bodies. And Specifically, these regulatory T cells um, uh, are educated by the microbes so that they moderate the B and T cells uh, for, uh, response, basically calming the overreaction of, um, of, for example, IgE response to pollen, dust, mites, and certain foodstuffs. Of course, as with any hormesis, exposure to the wrong microbes at the wrong time creating infection or delayed exposure can actually uh, lead to autoimmune disease and allergy as well. So here's a couple examples, and he lays these out in the book, and I can't go into all of them, but I would encourage you to read it. Uh, asthma, really interesting study in here comparing the Karelians who lived in the part of Finland that uh, after the Second World War went with the Soviet Union versus the Finns, the modern Finns. And the Karelians did not modernize their water supply they still lived on farms. The Finns did. And what happened? Huge difference in the incidence of asthma and autoimmune disease. And this was traced to the presence or absence of uh, microbes such as Helicobacter pylori and T. gondii in, uh, in the water supply. Uh, allergies have, have, have been associated with urbanization. And one of the interesting findings of the book is that people who grew up on farms where they were exposed to cow sheds or animal feces in Sweden and Uganda had much lower incidence of asthma and allergies, but they had high prevalence of lactobacillus parasites and worms, helminths, right? And the disappearance of these from our microbiome is associated with the rise of, of uh, asthma and autoimmunity. A number of other examples here. The other thing I would point out here is the importance of timing. All right, so uh, sometimes it's important when you're exposed to the microbe. Classic example, MS. Uh, we're all exposed to the Epstein-Barr virus. Most of us are. Uh, but but in, a, in a cleaner and cleaner environment, there's less of that, right? So what they found is that people who were not exposed to Epstein-Barr until their teens or their 20s were more prone to get MS, similar to uh, the prevalence of mononucleosis. Those who were exposed at a much earlier stage tend to be protected. Autism, similar story, but this goes back to childhood or maybe even in utero. All right. Now let's talk about the other type of defense, which is the xenobiotic metabolism. This is your defense against foreign chemicals like, uh, well, phyt phytochemicals, but also other toxins. What's really interesting is that the NRF2, which is the transcription factor, is stimulated by, by these chemicals, basically aromatic chemicals like phytonutrients in, found in uh, peppers or in carrots or in broccoli, or by exercise. And when it's stimulated, you get the production of a number of autoimmune, I mean, uh, antioxidant enzymes, such as glutathione transferase, uh, glutathione peroxidase, superoxide dismutase, uh, and these are your endogenous antioxidants. Paradoxically, if you take a lot of antioxidants orally, exogenously, you suppress the NRF2 system. So you may get a stoichiometric short-term benefit, but you're turning off your body's ability to make catalyt catalytic antioxidants, which are far more powerful. Now let's get into the third level of hormesis, metabolic hormesis. Some of you might recognize this character, Wim Hof. He's a big believer in 
cold exposure, as am I. And I'll talk about four stimuli that turn on your metabolic hormetic systems. Cardio and high intensity weight training, fasting, carbohydrate restriction, which turn on autophagy and keto adaptation, cold exposure, which turns on thermogenesis, and hypoxia. What's interesting, and I gave a little preview of this when I talked about altitude when it was in uh, Boulder, is that all of these fit into a single stress response system. All right, this stress sensor, which is called PGC1-alpha, which is peroxisome, proliferator activated, uh, GC, 1-alpha, <laughs> uh, it binds with your PPAR receptor, and it's sensitive to cold, to altitude, to exercise, and to calorie restriction. And these transcription factors are throughout the body. They're in your liver, they're in your muscle tissue, your fat, they're in your brain. But there's a couple important pathways that come out of the PGC1-alpha transcription factor. One is it's the master regulator of mit mitochondrial biosynthesis. The, the more it's stimulated, the more mitochondria you'll grow, right? That's your energy system. It turns on, uh, in your muscles, something called FNDC5 irisin, which is a, uh, uh, a hormonal system that converts white fat to brown fat, makes you more metabolically active. It stimulates your BDNF, your brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is very important for neurogenesis and, and ultimately for mood. So it has important uh, effect on appetite suppression, on your desire to exercise, your insulin sensitivity, and on a process called autophagy, which we'll talk about a little bit. So what is the primary thing that it does? It inhibits what's called mTOR. mTOR is a pathway that is very good to have when you're young because it stimulates protein synthesis and growth. But when you get past middle age, it can lead to uh, processes like cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurodegeneration because it becomes overactive. So you don't want that mTOR process to be going into old age. And mTOR basically uh, is inhibited by the PGC1 alpha cascade through a protein called RED1. It also turns on this process called autophagy, which I think you've heard a few people talk about, but it's basically a cellular house cleaning process. You have all these damaged proteins and lipids inside your cell. When you fast, or when you have the PGC1 alpha cascade, when you expose yourself to cold or exercise, this process turns on and you clean out a lot of these damaged proteins, which if they accumulate can lead to all kinds of metabolic problems. So how does autophagy promote longevity? Well, again, it, it, it clears out the aggregated proteins, it reduces inflammation, senescence, oncogenesis, but it also upregulates your innate immune response and removes intracellular pathogens. Now, a little aside, why do we age? There's three different theories of why we age. There's the genetic programming theory, which says it's just in our genes. It's inevitable. We have a finite lifespan. There's the damage accumulation theory, which says it's free radicals, right? Too much oxidation going on. So you should take antioxidants. And then Mikhail Blagosklany uh, and Walter Longo and Ron Rosedale have proposed this hyperfunction theory, which says it's mTOR. The mTOR process goes too long. It causes uh, inflammations, too much cell division, ultimately leads to um, all of the metabolic disorders. And this is where hormesis would be beneficial because it shuts down that process. So the question is, what about this middle theory, the damage accumulation theory? A really good example, a counterexample of the uh, damage accu accumulation theory is the naked mole rat. Now, ordinary lab rats can live a few years, right? But there's this weird looking rat, that's all wrinkly, that lives underground called the naked mole rat, which can live not just three years, but can live up to 30 years. Interestingly, when it's been analyzed, it's absolutely racked with oxidative stress. It's, you know, all of its proteins are cross-linked and there's uh, plaques and it looks like a mess, right? Wrinkly, but it has a huge antioxidant defense. Those f sources of oxidation have turned on its endogenous antioxidants and is protected and it has very low mTOR. 
So which theory is right? The accumulated damage theory or the mTOR theory? BDNF is also upregulated by this whole pathway, and that's, again, this uh, hormone that is not just in your brain but in your muscles that carries out really useful processes like neurogenesis, uh, and it tends to be, uh, low BDNF tends to be associated with obesity uh, in the muscles. Uh, it's also associated with improved insulin sensitivity. So you want to have BDNF. Um, also, it surprisingly makes us want to exercise, right? So having this cascade in place improves the urge to exercise. So it's really everything kind of going in the right direction. And one way I like to think about this is two different cycles. There's the virtuous cycle of hormesis, where if you have hormesis, you grow more of these mitochondria, you have more energy, you have an urge to exercise, and you, you're willing to go out and take cold showers and restrict your calorie. You have more energy to do that. On the other hand, there's the vicious cycle of inflammation. If you have eat an inflammatory diet and you're not and you're sitting around comfortably and not and you're eating too much food, then your mitochondria are not growing, you have less energy, so you want to eat more, and that's a reinforcing cycle. And I won't go into too much detail here, but since a lot of you are interested in keto adaptation. I think this is another example of metabolic hormesis, right? So we have a lot of flexibility. We can eat a high-carb diet, a low-carb diet. But when you go into a, a, a fasted state, you start producing ketones, and you get a lot of the benefits of nutritional ketosis that people here have talked about. What's not often recognized is that true keto adaptation takes a long time. It can take two to three weeks. And that's because you have to adjust your glycogen stores in your liver and your muscle and your kidney, you have to, it takes time to grow more mitochondria, it takes time to upregulate your antioxidant enzymes, and there's adjustments in your membrane lipids, et cetera. And if you want to read more about this, I think uh, uh, Stephen Finney and Jeff Follett have written a good book on keto adaptation and the biochemistry that underlies it. So now let's go to the highest level of hormesis. Psychological hormesis. Again, this is not just some weird spiritual thing. There's actually hard, sci hard science and psychology and neurology behind it. So I'll, I'll give two illustrations of uh, psychological hormesis, which I define as the increased resilience in the face of discomfort by voluntarily exposing yourself to stress. All right? So there's two guys. Richard Solomon and J.D. Corbett, who in 1974 uh, did some research which led to what they called the opponent process theory of emotion. And they wanted to explain two things. Why is it that people become addicted? But also, why is it that st stressful experiences can lead to a feeling of well-being? And as examples, they, they, they looked at several pleasures here on the left side of addictions that were pleasurable in the short term, but led to very difficult subsequent withdrawal symptoms. Alcohol, cocaine, gambling, eating highly palatable sweet foods, smartphones, right? And then on the other side, challenges that had the reverse effect. They were terrifying or actually very unpleasant in the short term, but they gave rise to sustained feelings of good feeling. The, the first case study they went after was skydiving, but they looked at firefighters, marathon runners, and I would add in my own, which is cold showers, which fits into the same category. So I want to read you a quote, which I think really describes this to a T. This is the interviews with military um, uh, parachutists. During the first free fall, before the parachute opens, the military parachutists may experience terror. They may yell, their pupils dilated, their eyes bulging, their bodies curled forward and stiff, their heart racing and breathing irregular. After they land safely, they may walk around with a stunned and stony-faced expression for a few minutes, and they usually smile and chatter and gesticulate, being very socially active, and then they appear to be elated. After many parachute jumps, the signs of effective habituation are clear. The fearful reaction is usually undetectable, and instead, the parachutists look tense, eager, or excited, and during the free fall, they experience a thrill. The activity is high, with leaping and shouting and euphoria, the period, often described as exhilaration, 
decreases slowly but lasts often two to three hours. So starting out terrified, and then you get a brief period of pleasure afterward, but with time, that terror goes away, you're habituated, but you get a long and sustained period of pleasure. And they represented this with a very nice set of diagrams, and I want to explain this. On the left, you'll see what I described in the initial period of that, uh, uh, for the parachutists. They, the state A here is an intense state. It can be pleasant or unpleasant. So it could be the addiction if you reverse it. But let's take the pleasure one first. Uh, a state of fear uh, with, with the, with the um, so, sorry, let's take the skydiving first. An intense state of fear with a, a delayed positive response, right? Uh, but with time, that state A, that fear is diminished, but the positive response is deeper and longer. With the addiction, the opposite is true. You, you have an intense pleasure, taking the drugs or the alcohol or gambling or whatever, but with time, uh, when, they, when you don't drink anymore, you get a, a down, you're coming down. The more you do it, however, the addict requires more and more substance, otherwise they're gonna have a very weak positive feeling, and they're down and their withdrawal is gonna be harder and harder. So these are the exact mirror images of each other, which is kind of interesting. Now, is this just psychology, right? No, it actually has a neurological basis on the receptor level. Let's look at dopamine receptors in the brain. On, in this study by Nora Volko, uh, you look at PET scans, positive emission tomography scans of the brains of people who are smokers, alcoholics, obese, or cocaine addicts. The normal are on the bottom here. All right, and red means highly stimulated. This is where you have very active dopamine receptors. You can see they've all got a lot of red in their striatum. But the smoker, the alcoholic, the obese, and the cocaine addict, it's far diminished. They're just not activating their dopamine receptors. So that stimulus of the pleasure has actually caused the body to hormetically, homeostatically, downregulate the receptors. Similarly, here's a, here's a case where uh, cocaine addicts, this is over a six-month period and 12-month period, you can see they're just not getting the same response over time in their basal ganglia. And similarly, here's the opposite. Can you use hormesis to actually reverse the process? This is the other side of the opponent process theory. Well, here's a study of caloric restriction, fasting, in laboratory rats after four months. And they had obese and lean mice, and you can see here that when they had unrestricted food access, which is in the top, they had very low dopamine receptor activation. But here's the rats after they've practiced fasting <laughs> for four months, intermittent fasting, and they have a lot of dopamine activation. They're happier, all right? And there are similar studies here in humans looking at activation of dopamine receptors in, 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 uh, in meth addicts, showing that the meth addicts, when they were abstinent and combined that with exercise, had significant upregulation in their D2 receptors where the ones that did not exercise, no change. All right? Um, antidepressants, similar story. The idea with antidepressants is SSRIs increase the concentration of serotonin in the synapse, so you get a sense of well-being. However, there, there's been found to be a, tolerating, a tolerance effect where at least in certain individuals, uh, the 5-HT2A the, the, uh, HT, receptors, the serotonin receptors, are downregulated, making them less responsive. So again, the thing you have to consider in exposing yourself either to pleasure or pain is there's an immediate effect and then there's a secondary effect, and that's what sometimes is not taken into account. So here's how I would summarize the psychological hormesis in terms of what I would call the receptor control theory. Whatever the receptors we're talking about, serotonin, dopamine, or in the case of even other metabolic effects, insulin, leptin, right? Whatever the receptors are, the more you stimulate them, the more downregulated, and the reverse is true. Individuals have set points. We tend to have the same body fat through life unless we change something. We, sent, we tend to have the same level of pleasure through life unless we change something. So what I've shown here then in this diagram is Here's an individual who is a little bit heavier 
and maybe unhappy, it does not have a lot of receptors. It has a very low receptor density. Here's your average person in the middle, and here's the person who's practiced hormesis. They've grown all their D2 receptors. They've grown a lot of serotonin receptors. They're able to be happy on less food with less exogenous stimulant because they're generating, uh, uh, the, the, the receptors are much more sensitive to dopamine, right? So they can function with less input. And so essentially, just like you have a body fat set point, I think you have a pleasure set point, and you can affect that. And that's not a day-to-day -day thing. This is a long-term thing. It takes time to change that. So psychological hormesis, in short, I think, is engaging in physical challenges and where you can increase your pleasure budget, your pleasure set point, and make yourself more resilient when you do face those stresses. All right? So I'll, I'll try to uh, bring it to a close here. At all four levels we've talked about, the structural, the defense, the metabolic, and the psychological, there's a couple principles that apply. First of all, plasticity. Uh, we're all much more adaptable than we realize. We can change significantly. Second, specificity. All of these stresses that I've talked about are very specific to a particular muscle, to your callus, to a particular metabolic pathway, to a particular psychological uh, response to a chemical or a activity, all right? So think about it not as a general type of a stimulus, but a very specific one. Third one, very important, supercompensation. We, we showed the, the diagram for muscle growth, but this applies to every single one of these. When you have a hormetic stress, you're going to lose some capability in the short term. But if you do it right, you'll get a supercompensation, and then each cycle builds your capacity. Um, secondary adaptation. These are not primary adaptations, not immediate responses, but they're, uh, uh, the secondary adaptation takes weeks sometimes. And finally, intermittency, very important. We talked about stress. What we're talking about here are acute stresses that are applied occasionally, not chronic stresses which wear us down. So let me just illustrate a few of these last two points. Primary and secondary adaptation. Uh, resistance exercise, focusing, fasting, cold exposure. We get benefits in hours to minutes and then they disappear. But the secondary response is what you're aiming at. Muscle hypertrophy, changing the length of your eye, keto adaptation, true adaptation to cold or stress. This takes typically weeks to months, repeated cycles. And this is where most people give up and they don't realize that they try one or two cold showers and it's uncomfortable and it's never for them. They try fasting for a day, they can't adjust so they give up. The adaptations take time. Stress oscillation, very important. You can't just be stressing yourself all the time. You have the active phase, the workout, activating your sympathetic nervous system, fasting, you lose a little weight, but really you also have to give yourself some rest to allow that stress, that adaptation to consolidate. You have to allow recovery of your muscles. You have to allow rest and sleep. You have to allow when you're fasting sometime also to eat. <laughs> and you can't be challenging yourself psychologically all the time. All right, so to wrap it up, hormesis is everywhere in nature. Right? There are studies on microbes, plants, and animals. It operates at multiple levels, from the basic tissue repair to psychological resilience. In moderation, hormetic challenge leads to supercompensation. You end up better than where you started. You can increase your performance. Think of it like an investor. You have to make an investment, which is taking something out of you but in the hopes of getting a better long-term return. Um, beyond the advent of novel foods, I think the real mismatch here is that we've lost hormesis, we've lost the microbes, we've lost the exercise, we've lost the dietary challenges. And if we add those back, I think we'll no longer have such a mismatch. So get out there, do a little hormesis, uh, try intermittent fasting, try cold showers, and maybe even rock climbing or skydiving. Thank you. Excellent talk as always, uh, and this is a great topic, and it's, it just occurred to me at the end here that when you're describing homeostasis, which is a typical process of defending a set point of subtype that's all throughout our physiology, and there's this also concept of allostasis, where under conditions of like a, a chronic damaging condition, your body 
learns to defend a new homeostasis because it can't achieve the optimal one. What hormesis seems to suggest is a third type of this, uh, of this uh, uh, process of, maybe you'd call it uh, hyperstasis, where the uh, hormesis is actually causing you to change the uh, homeostatic uh, set point in a beneficial way. So it's more stable rather than less stable, like the opposite of allostasis. What do you think about that? No, I agree. And in fact, I do think there's positive allostasis and negative allostasis. So I would say that hormesis is positive allostasis, right? It's the idea of changing your set point, your body fat set point, your pleasure set point through uh, the supercompensation effect. But uh, yeah, I would agree. I think it's a kind of allostasis. Yeah. Hi, Todd. Um, thanks for your talk. Big fan of your work. Have you thought about the novelty of the hormetic stressor? So most of the things that you talked about, uh, it, it would seem that humans would probably have a lot of practice dealing with that type of stressor. Mm -hmm. But I wonder about things like electromagnetic fields that we've recently introduced into our environment that may be acting like a hormetic stressor, right? Maybe they're interfering with mitochondrial function, but humans have never seen that type of stressor before. Would yeah. you expect there to be a difference with things that we introduce that we don't have practice with? It's a good question, but a lot of these things we think are novel are we're, we're actually able to deal with. So, for example, radiation hormesis, I didn't go into it. It's right. a controversial area. There's always been radiation in the environment and studies of people who live near natural radiation. Sometimes they've right. shown a benefit. Chemicals, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a mixed bag there, but... A lot of the novel chemicals are related to right. chemicals in nature, which are also stressors. But you're probably right that there are stressors that we have never experienced, and then we would not be able to uh, right. defend and, ourselves. And I also wonder that, like the, especially with electromagnetic fields, like the, the pulsatility is gone, right? Like you're talking about intermittent, and now yeah. we're bathed in it at a level right. never if it's seen constant, before. you need the intermittency, I think. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, would you pl uh, place eating polyphenols? into hormesis? Yes, the polyphenols, these are the phytonutrients. Yes. These are in plants. And this is what our NRF2 system, our phase one, phase two antioxidant systems are designed to detoxify. And we, when we eat the polyphenols, we increase our endogenous antioxidants. Yeah. All right, thank you everybody. <laughs>